Excellent. So we're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin business models and uh, how much Bitcoin changes things. Or, you know, uh, and maybe there's a counterpoint. Maybe it doesn't really change that many things and actually it's just a better money and it doesn't really, you know, it's, it's independent. So who wants to start off? Are there any specific new business models that you see Bitcoin enables? Um, yeah, you know, it's changing the dynamic a little bit because um, you have an open network, right? Then people don't need permission, so it's harder for people to build moats. Um, it's easier for you to find competitors, which is great for consumers. Um, but it's also easier for you to get in and start something too. So I think that sort of like big tech monopoly thing uh, it's, it's going to trend towards less. Um, the way we approach it at Thunder um, and the way that we design our business and our games is really around, you know, not just adding Bitcoin to a business or to a product because it's Bitcoin and we think it's cool. Um, we approach it from a different angle, which is, you know, Bitcoin is not only sound money, it actually has some incredible properties that can be harnessed to like really advance your business. So when we approach um, Thunder and our products, we're like, okay, how can these properties of Bitcoin, you know, how can the properties of the Lightning Network enable us to solve problems in our industry, whether it's for game developers, um, for consumers, um, how can we leverage those properties to solve problems? And that's how we approach it first and foremost. But there's so much like that it can just be done to push the industry. Like, you know, um, in the app store, it's, you know, you can't really offer um, in-app purchases for less than like a dollar, a dollar ninety-nine. But that's incredibly cost prohibitive in parts of the world. So there's individuals who can't participate fully in some of these game economies. So um, with micro transactions, we're able to like really reduce that threshold and increase accessibility and also increase um, you know, our, our total addressable market. So I think there's just so many different ways, not just, hey, streaming for sats or this or that, but it's all about solving current business problems and then already kind of enhancing the current business models that you're working on. And that's how we approach it at Thunder. Eric, what's your take? It's just a money. <laughs> That's great. Why, well, let's have a spicy panel. Let's do it. Panel, right? <laughs> Somebody's got to say it. Um, but I, uh, okay. So the value proposition of Bitcoin is in being a stateless money. Right? If state wasn't constantly attacking money, the programmability aspects that we get out of Bitcoin would be easily achievable and much cheaper in private systems. So we have Bitcoin, um, which has these characteristics, programmability, and uh, interesting features. Um, but the value proposition is really the business of Bitcoin, right? That's, that's why people value it. What, what they're getting out of it is the state not attacking their money, either through inflation or through transparency, which allows the state to tax everything else. So um, business models, uh, the way I look at business models, I, you know, I've, I've started and sold a few companies, and came into Bitcoin as somebody interested in doing the same, and uh, for the last eight, nine years or so, I've just been donating my time to open source software because um, I found it very difficult to justify any business model um, in Bitcoin. Uh, the typical tech business model is centralized, take a piece, take a cut of the transactions, your Coinbase model, right? That's, that's one. The other is intellectual property, right? The software, IP it, sell it. Neither of those work in Bitcoin. Now, Coinbase is making some money, it works, but um, it is in direct conflict with the value proposition and very likely to be under heavy attack over time. Not something I would work on, right? But it is a business model. I, and I, I think that's an interesting point, Eric. I would, I'm curious to hear your view then. What about business models that potentially rely on the sense of resistance aspect of Bitcoin? Like, are there businesses that you can do with Bitcoin that you cannot do otherwise? Well, I mean, that's just being dark money, right? I mean, that's, that's Bitcoin. So if you have, you're essentially going to be just playing, paying cat and mouse with the government until, you know, they either fall or you get caught or you start finding jurisdictions that start profiting from that, that may have enough capacity to defend themselves against other state actors that don't want that to happen, right? But 
um, it is nice that you have this capacity now, but it's not that people weren't doing this before, it's just Bitcoin is just very good at doing that. I mean, I just want to chime in here because I, I agree and also disagree with Eric. Um, it definitely is just money. Um, you know, we get asked this all the time at Thunder. I mean, we're literally just trying to reintroduce a value layer to the idea of play. Um, but I think, you know, he's talking about, you know, really what Bitcoin is at the end of the day. But unfortunately, the world does not give a shit about any of that. Um, you know, 80% of our users are totally new to Bitcoin, and most of them don't care. They don't have any idea what the government is up to. They don't really have a very keen sense of, like, what is going on with inflation. And what we're doing at Thunder is just using these games as a way to introduce people to Bitcoin for the first time and introduce those properties to them. So, you know, we really consider ourselves top of the funnel and it's like, you know, hey, like, yes, we are at the end of the day, like we care about our unit economics, we care about making money, but at the end of the day, like we are very mission driven and unfortunately, if we just put Bitcoin out there as, hey, come get this because it's censorship resistant, because it's peer to peer, all the reasons we love Bitcoin, unfortunately, people don't actually care about that. So if there's ways that we can approach them where they're at, I think it's much easier to onboard those individuals. Well, I mean, they're not going to start at crypto economics. They're going to they're going to start there, well, and then they're going to buy a cold card, well, and then they're going to get crypto economics. They work we this tell way. them to buy cold, this way. Board, cold card eventually. Yeah, you know, but that's the thing. It's like I don't expect them to do any of that. Like it, it, it's like somebody has to go and convince people through different kinds of incentives to get into Bitcoin, right? Uh, unless we have state failure. Well, well, ultimately, if they don't know and they don't care, it doesn't matter. They don't need it. Right? It's the people who do know and do care that need it. And as things get worse in different parts of the world, uh, people learn pretty quickly. And those are the people I work for, right? Uh, Venezuelans, Zimbabweans, Nigerians, whatever. And maybe someday Americans and Canadians and Australians. <laughs> you know, it's funny you brought that up, right? I, I never thought that, you know, uh, the global south kind of thing, they get that they need Bitcoin or something like it, right? Because life is complicated. The government doesn't want you to have dollars and, you know, you are not allowed to do things. But, you know, in Canada, you'd never think that, you know, your your bank account money is going to get frozen or something just because Castro's but son doesn't want Canadians you to have Canadians learn pretty quickly that, right? you know, they might need Bitcoin, right? No, it, it, it's... It, I, it was so weird. I mean, like, wh what do you mean you're going to freeze people's bank accounts because they're donating to some people who are protesting? Yeah. And, and you know, it, it was amazing because it was a gift. Like, it, it just showed that you can have a first world country that is way more organized than America is. First world? <laughs> no longer. <laughs> Let's touch a little bit on some of the microtransactions aspects, because I think that might be interesting. I know, obviously, NVK is a big Nostra man. He's a big supporter of Nostra. Obviously, Des, you've got, you know, Thunder Games. You're doing these tiny transactions. But on the other hand, there is obviously seminal work by, infam you know, the infamous uh, microtransactions work by Nick Zaba saying, oh, no, it's, it's not going to work for that because of the mental accounting costs. What, what do you guys think? Do you guys think it, it adds a whole new layer and maybe, it, you know, it, it, Nick was wrong on that point. I mean, for us, um, I believe it adds an entirely new behavior. And I will say I agree on um, the part where people, maybe they just don't deserve Bitcoin yet. But, like, I believe in saving the world. Like, I would love to, like, reach people before they're absolutely miserable. But, you know, like, we all approach it in different ways. Um, but the microtransaction piece, I think, is really interesting for us because you know, we get asked all the time at games conferences, um, you know, like... <laughs> I got asked literally on Tuesday, so what does the Bitcoin happen on? Is that like on Polkadot? Um, so it's just like, it's just so simple that people don't get it. And for our mobile games, we do specifically mobile games. Like we're able to really influence user behavior um, in the game and really kind of enhance the gameplay. So, um, you know, if you're thinking in, the, if you think about like a habit loop, um, you know, in queue, you know, behavior reward, um, we're able to really kind of wait 
that reward aspect of the habit loop and it really kind of increases that um, habituation cycle and it really drives engagement. I mean, for better or for worse, honestly, like it's a mobile game, but we're really able to like influence what our users are doing in the game. And we've, you know, found like by, just by simply putting these tiny microtransactions into the game, like we can improve our long-term retention by well over 500%. And like, that's a game changer in the state of the mobile games industry with the whole ATT changes and whatnot. So you're really putting a lot of power in the hands of like developers to, con to directly connect with their users and like yeah. really kind of reward their users for spending time in game and creating value for you yeah. as well. And I think interestingly on that, as I understand from the gaming world, obviously you're in the gaming world and the Bitcoin world, but in the gaming world, I understand there are a lot of gamers and customers who don't like the DLC aspect because they see it like it's, oh, it's a cash grab aspect. Whereas you've done it in a different way. It's not like, oh, you pay sats for the DLC. It's more like you get rewarded in sats. I'm curious if you have any comment. Was that part of your thinking in the model? Um, yeah, I mean, we're like eventually, you know, very soon we'll be, you will be able to buy things in the games with sats, but we wanted to like really grow a user base who trusts us. We're and also just keep it incredibly simple. Um, you know, you're watching ads. You're like, we're making revenue off of this. You know, there has to be a way that we, we can kind of um, reward you for spending um, time in game. But I think, you know, again, like there's a whole history of microtransactions and in games and in game economies. And, you know, like wh whether it was like Diablo's auction house, Battlefront, um, their loot boxes, you know, it's been incredibly poorly received, right? People really pushed back, but that's because these economies were being driven by the developer or the publisher. Um, you know, we're, what we're building is using Bitcoin as this peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, transfer of value. We're allowing our users to develop their own gotcha. economies. And, and to be clear, I'm, you know, that is one criticism, but at the same time, there's revealed preference, right? People say they don't like something, but they actually do buy DLCs. So, you know, to be clear, that's, you know, it's not necessarily a critique of DLC kind of models anyway. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Nostra aspect, because I'm sure you've got, you know, either, do you see, uh, probably NVK or anyone else, do you see new business models there or um, viable businesses in a Nostra culture? So, like, Bitcoin is free of money, and the, you still need freedom comms, right? You can't trade if you don't have a place to coordinate and talk about what you want to buy and sell to each other. So um, Noster is this like very interesting new way of a, a new communication protocol essentially and, and you know it, it's working well. Uh, it's based on, on um, uh, key pair cryptography and uh, essentially get your private key and then you have a public key and you know but you own your identity the same way you own your Bitcoin. Um, and what that really enables is, like, now you have a persona that you can sort of essentially send money to. Um, and, and you can use this protocol to, you know, do the, the micro uh, blogging thing like Twitter. Uh, but that's sort of like, that's interesting, but that's like, you know, just a small little aspect of that, right? And people are doing that with zaps instead of likes, so you can actually send little sats between each other, and it's creating better incentives. So, uh, People find actually way more engagement uh, on the numbers uh, on Nostr than they do on Twitter, for example, right? Uh, artists can find some, like, uh, uh, some uh, money back, some value for value there. Uh, how that goes, if that wins or not, it's beyond me. We'll see in the future. But where it gets interesting is that now that you have this persistent identity that you own, um, you can use that for trade and, you know, you have the Bitcoin going back and forth in the system where you know who you're sending to, you have some reputation capacity, uh, you have a very efficient way of putting bids and asks. It, if it's as simple as a Craigslist replacement, right, which we do have already uh, for an offer for something, uh, all the way to people try to do actual sort of like DGEN contracts for, you know, exchanging PSBTs and, you know, whatever they're going to go to. But we, we have now two networks that are permissionless and they're sort of like match made in heaven. And an interesting point there might be that we might see more, speaking of Bitcoin business model boom, we might see more people able to become an entrepreneur or be able to sell things because it's all in the app and it's on Nostra. Maybe they are otherwise unbanked. You don't need are, permission. Yeah. That's the key. 
So historically, Bitcoin business models, I guess, if you look back to the early years of Bitcoin, it was, you know, you were either doing Bitcoin mining or you were an exchange and lots of other models were just not that profitable, right? Although I know you've been, <laughs> you've been doing CoinKite for a long time. Um, but obviously that's changing now, right? We're seeing a more of a culture. Is it about also changing the culture in Bitcoin uh, that, you know, people are going to uh, participate in some of these uh, business models? It's just money, right? Like, so it's, it's just money. People are going to use money, right? Bitcoin doesn't have a community. It has like many tribes. There's no dollar community, right? It's just, it feels cozy now, but as this thing grows, people are just going to use it. And, and if it's a good money, people are going to dish out the other crappy money. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. Yeah, where, where people want to be anonymous or private, it's a good money. I mean, it's better than most, right? It's not perfect, and that's what we work on, right? I think, I think the improvements to privacy in Bitcoin are the most significant you know, core development tasks. Um, I, I don't really focus or concern myself too much about adoption. I mean, there's plenty of people that do that kind of stuff, but I figure if people don't want it, then, <laughs> no big deal, right? If they, if they need it, they need it. They're going to come. Um, and so I, I personally, I, I don't, that's not a business model that I really care about, but, um, I do care about people's ability to use it for these scenarios where privacy matters. Um, and those are hard. I mean, you know, we're ta talking about Nostrum, you know, it sounds great. I haven't used it. I don't, I don't know anything about it, but, um, you know, a, a, a censorship resistant communication system where you have kind of a persistent identity, uh, pseudonymous or not. Sounds like a you know fairly easy target by a sensor, right? So these are difficult problems. Yeah, I, I mean you know there's a lot of open questions, but you have this sort of many-to-many -many relationships with relays. Uh, you, you know you can have private relay, you can have a, a public relay. It's it can be distributed, it can be decentralized. Like the, you have essentially ephemeral notes, right? You're gonna love it because you can write long posts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't like long posts. I don't read them. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I, I agree to, on one side of the thing. I think it's like very weird to identify, like have your personal identi and identity like tied so closely to money. Like I find it almost kind of perverse. Like a Floyd Mayweather money thing. Yeah, yeah it, it's strange. Um, so I kind of shied away from it myself. But like, I mean, obviously I love working on this and you know, love the other people who are working on it. But I mean, kind of on the totally opposite end of the spectrum, it's a, you know, we've actually been able to create our own community for Thunder um, with Bitcoin, um, you know, and it's, again, like some, these microtransactions, you know, we um, like creating a, a really great discord is really hard, and it, but it's absolutely in, essential in Ga the gaming space and we have this really vibrant community who you know they're active but a lot of times people are active and then they fade away and hop on another game discord um, but for us we're able to like just tip these individuals with tip bots you know we just built a quick tip bot and you know we have these individuals throughout the world you know we have someone in Lebanon um, you know we actually found our community manager um, in Venezuela um, and we those these individuals were doing translations creating memes like they now just run our TikTok account um, you know and we're able to like keep them incredibly engaged and rewarded because these other discords people are creating memes they're going on these t these Twitter accounts with 500,000 users again generating value for these companies and they're doing it all for free. I mean, you look at Roblox, like that's like child exploitation, like at its finest. Um, so we're able to like really kind of grow and reward our community for everything that they're doing for us. Um, so I think it is, you know, I kind of am on complete opposite ends of the yeah. spectrum on that. Well, I think we're just about to run out of time, but I guess I would just summarize what our panelists have said. There's a, a synthesis in some ways. Well, it's, it's better money, like Eric says, but at the same time, maybe there are some things that you can use and maybe that's the lesson for you in the audience or people watching on the stream that uh, you can use Bitcoin as part of your business model and it can enable things that might not otherwise be possible. So with that, well, let's finish up. Can everyone please put your hands together for Desiree, NVK and Eric. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville.
Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th. 